बच्ची कैसे करेंगे इस तरह रिकॉर्डिंग रिकॉर्ड कर रहा है अहमद हु वसल्ली अला रसूल करीम अल्लाह बाद أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والشمس وضحاها والقمر إذا تلاها والنهار إذا جلاها والليل إذا يغشاها رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأهل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أمين يا رب So today I will be discussing the hadith that is in Sahih Bukhari. It is a long hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. However, I will mention this hadith and try to explain it. It's a very uh, a hadith that can be misunderstood very easily. And so I'm going to have to give a introduction to one or two aspects of the science of hadith before I actually delve into this particular hadith. This hadith as I pondered over it and thought about it its importance became more and more clear to me. as you will also inshallah I will share with you some things that i think are very profound <clears throat> the first thing that should be clear about the sciences of hadith that is that when you look at any hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam you are only looking at that particular event in other words just like a doctor if he's looking at your eyes He's not going to give you a prescription for your back pain. He's going he's looking at your eyes. In general when you're studying medicine, you will learn that if you're looking at the eyes, these are the symptoms to look for and this is the prescription that goes with it something like this. But a real human being when you're really looking at a human being, you're looking at not just the eyes, he may also have a sore back, he may also have a sore throat, he may also have so many other problems. So you're looking at all of those things together when you're looking at the real human being. In the same way when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he mentions something For example when he, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said wallahi la yu'min wallahi la yu'min wallahi la yu'min I swear by Allah he doesn't believe he doesn't believe he doesn't believe who whose neighbor are not safe from him Now does this hadith for instance Does this put a complete judgment on a real human being like let's say someone has a neighbor and they don't feel safe from him Do we take this hadith and then apply it upon him and say see because your neighbors are not safe safe from you therefore this is the judgment upon you We don't do this why because of his amal he has many actions he has many actions this is one of his actions to which this hadith applies but maybe he also is raising orphans for example so the hadith about the man who raises orphans orphan girls is also applied to him right so you you don't take one action and look at that one symptom or that one problem and attach that one hadith that you find applicable to him the ahadith are general rules only looking at that particular action that is being mentioned nothing more than it nothing less than it so when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is saying something 
to the negative consequences. For example, if the Prophet said, "Cursed is the one is like is the cursed is the one the male who who is like who pretends to be or looks like thee, dresses like thee, female." Now, when you have hard words like curse, then that means that this will weigh heavy against him. This will what? Weigh very heavy against him on the day of judgment. But it's still not a complete what? Judgment against him. Also, sometimes a particular situation. For example, somebody just converted. He was drinking alcohol. He was doing drugs. And so because... And even, let's say, he converted five, six years ago. But in five, six years, he has not been let go. Uh, he can let go of his alcohol problem. So all these things need to be taken into consideration. So why I'm saying this? Because this hadith is a hadith that, if not understood in that general principle, then it may be misapplied and misunderstood. So I wanted that to be clear. Then the next thing that... Uh, I want to clear is going to be coming in the hadith. I'm not going to read the hadith actually. Uh, I'm going to just read a part of the actual translation so that I can actually get onto the subject at hand. So the hadith is in Sahih Bukhari. And it is a hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ, after the eclipse prayers, the, the prayer of the eclipse, uh, he explains a few things. So he's done this long prayer. The Prophet ﷺ gave this long, 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 long prayer in which he read Surah Al-Baqarah, uh, some equal to the length of Surah Al-Baqarah, a very long, you know, uh, long prayer. And then, in that prayer, an event happens in which the Prophet ﷺ sees heaven and he sees hell. Now the Prophet is being asked about this event in which he saw this. We will go into the detail of this next time. But the only thing that I want to mention is this part. I have never seen before such a horrible sight as that, meaning the hellfire. Okay. And I saw that the majority of its dwellers, meaning in the hellfire, were women. By the way, this hadith is in Sahih Bukhari. And majority of the dwellers of the hellfire, according to this hadith, are women. Even though there's another hadith in Sahih Bukhari, that every mu'min will be married to two women in Jannah. At least two women of the wives, not the hur. The hur al-ayn are the servants of the wives. The hur al-ayn are the... Servants of the wives. But the wives of dunya, there will be two for every, minimum of two for every male. Meaning that there will not only be more women in hell, but also there will be more women in huh? Jannah. So this uh, point should be clear because there are more women in Jannah than there are men in Jannah. And in the same way, there are more women in the hellfire as there are men. So the Prophet ﷺ said, the majority of his dwellers were women. But the Prophet said this, why? To make a point. So now the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, they say, Ya Rasulullah, what is the reason for that? And this is the key point. Women usually, my sisters, they get caught up on, oh, why does Islam say majority of the people will be, majority of the people in the hellfire will be women. But the real lesson is really, really important. And that is why that that will be the case. And so, uh, they asked, O oh, Messenger of Allah, why is that the reason? He replied, because of their bikufrihinna. Bikufrihinna. Because of their ungratefulness. And then, they, they replied, are they not, uh, you know, they say because of their, do they disbelieve in Allah? They do kufr of Allah. They deny Allah. And the Prophet replied, they are not thankful to their husbands, and they're ungrateful for the favors done to them. Even if you do good to them all your life, the word actually is not all your life, it's dahar. Dahar meaning for some time and space, you've done good to them. When she seems, and then after that, she continues, she will still say, I have never seen any good from you. Now this, you know, it seems like, 
if one wants to be nitpicking, it, it would be because we live in this age, I'm sorry to say, of feminazis. Uh, we live in this age where everyone's talking about the rights of the women, which is very important. But because Islam is a complete code, it not only talks about the rights of women and the morality that's due to the women, but it is also talking about the rights of the men and the morality or the ihsan, the goodness that can be done to them. And when we're looking at harmony within society, we need to have all the rights, not just rights of women, and but also the rights of men, the ihsan towards women, and also the ihsan towards the men. Both of these things need to be kept in mind in order to understand the issue of how to bring harmony within the family. As you will see, this is not a small issue. And by the way, there's a rule, another fiqhi rule that we should understand. And this is actually more a Qur'anic rule than a fiqhi rule. And that is that the Qur'an doesn't require the one who is obligated to give shukr. But the one to whom the obligation is being done to is the one who is being required to give, to be grateful. For example, anishkul li wali wali be grateful to me, right? Even though Allah is our Allah, He is our Raza, He has to provide for us. He's created this whole creation. He is responsible for taking care of it. He is the Al Khalik, He is the Al Bari, He is the Al Raza, He is the Al Latif. He is the one who will take care of His creation. This is, this, is, this is upon Himself. He will do this. But we are still grateful to Allah for the good that He gives to us. In the same way, the parents. The parents, they're obligated to take care of the child. But the child is obligated to be grateful to the parents. And when it comes to the husband-wife relationship, it becomes, oh, he, you're obligated to do that. You're just obligated to be, uh, to, to, uh, to fulfill your, that's true. But when someone is fulfilling his or her obligation to you, or Allah is fulfilling his obligation to you, you are still required to be grateful to Allah, number one that you are in a position where someone is fulfilling his rights to you. And number two, you are required to be grateful to the person who is fulfilling that obligation to you yourself. So now, this hadith, because of the ungratefulness, because of their kufr, now notice the scene here. The Prophet does this long, long, long prayer. And after that, the Prophet is mentioning this specifically after the 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 the, uh, the prayer of eclipse. Why? This is a very dramatic scene because the Prophet could have said this any time, right? But he has one of the longest prayers in Jama'ah he has ever done with any of the companions. One of the longest prayers he's ever done with any of the companions. And then after that, he's mentioning this, and he's doing this in a manner to actually teach the people. So when he said, بِكُفْرِهِنَّ They asked because of the kufr to Allah. Right? He's having them ask him questions. And then he says, no, because of their ungratefulness to their husbands. Why doesn't it come in Qur'an? And this is a good example of the <laughs> harmony between the Qur'an and the Sunnah, for example. The Qur'an emphasized the general rule with the parents. The Qur'an what? Emphasize the general rule, you have to be grateful to Allah and grateful to the parents. And then from there you understand how it works down, how, and how it trickles down to the rest of what? Society. And in the hadith you have specifically this, you know, very hard words. And generally you know that Prophet ﷺ, he doesn't use these hard words that often, in such a general sense. So anyway, because of their ungratefulness, it was said, do they disbelieve in Allah? Because, uh, uh, are they ungrateful to Allah? Meaning, he replied, they are not thankful to their husbands and they're ungrateful for the favors done to them. Now, is there something in psychology that we know about women's psychology that has to do with this issue? So I want to bring to you your attention this uh, paper that's been written by Robert Emmons and Charles Shelton called Gratitude and the Science of Positive Psychology. Gratitude and the science of positive psychology. And particularly, if you look at it from any perspective, the human experience perspective, the evolutionary perspective, I'm going to elaborate 
If you want to look at it from a purely scientific evolutionary perspective, I will simply say that the men were the hunters and gatherers. The men went out to get what? Food. And who was being provided with that food? Whether it is uh, also, also who is the one in the, in the animal world who takes care of the females, generally? The male. So how, what, is this, what is the evolutionary mechanism that makes, a, what is the, the, the thinking process of females? They want security, what else? They want what? Food, what else? They, they want more, right? They're the ones who need the protection. They're the ones who need the security. So women are always, what, needy, even from an evolutionary point of view. Do you see what I'm trying to say? So because of this needness quality that is embedded in women, whether you look at it from an evolutionary point of view or just human history, right, that men are always providing for the women. And because men are always providing for the women, what happens? Women expect to be provided for. They expect to be provided for. So, just to keep these things in mind, and I will now uh, read just a few parts of this article, and then I will discuss. And you know, this, added, this thing that the Prophet said that looks so harsh to our sisters many times, if you actually study this issue about when, because it is well known, well known in psychology, you can pick up the very famous book, uh, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, for example, I'll give you one example. Uh, they say in this particular, this book, which it became very, very popular, <coughs> one of the aspects that was discussed in this book is that women are like waves. Women are like waves. And men are like rubber bands. Okay? Now this book is a pioneering book, the book that I'm talking about, and in about gender studies and how men are different from women, and it goes into some good detail about it. And then later on there were other works done that were also very fascinating. But I want to talk about this wave. And the rubber band. The rubber band is guys like to get close to their wives or their whoever. They like to get close to their wives and then they like to have their space. Like go into the Batman's cave. This is the word used by the author. And then they like to go back to their wives. And so the men, they like going in and out of the house. Kind of like they want to be close and then they need time to themselves. And there are other, many other, even like when guys are upset about something, they don't want to be bothered by others, right? They want their own time. Women have waves in the same way that men have rubber bands. They work, women have waves, which is that they're very happy and then they're very uh, depressed, affected by hormones, very sad, so on and so forth. And then, they, then it goes up and then it goes down. down and then it goes up and down. And this is natural for women to be affected by their hormones. Yes, there are women that are not affected by their hormones at all. And this is the thing about, when you study Islam, one thing that has to be clear in your minds, women, there's a very large spectrum of women. There are those women that can't get out of their beds because of the pain cramps that they have. And then there are women that can function normally, like as if nothing, they're not, their bodies are not going through anything. You all know what I'm talking about. Right? So, there, so women are a very large spectrum of, in terms of how there are women who are very feminine and other women who are not as feminine. So there's this very large, whereas males are almost pretty predictable, is, is, is generally how we would understand it. So uh, because of this wave that women go through, up and down and up and down, this one reason, and then Number two, they want to be provided for, they expect to be provided for. And other psychological reasons that sometimes women have to remember that they, you know there's a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet said that there is a lady, this Prophet said, this say hadith by the way, there's a lady, she does, she hopes and she prays to Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I get married. And then after some time she gets married. That what she was praying, Allah get me married, and you know, nowadays Muslims are under a curse. That it's hard for our daughters to get married. This is really a situation that we're going through in, in our society. And so, anyway, the point being that when she gets married, 
she forgets the the the, the great the, the favor Allah had done upon her that like out of all the women she got married to some good guy and then she becomes uh, you know ungrateful to him. This is another hadith by the way. So the point here is is that in what is the result of being ungrateful? And why the Prophet ﷺ specifically says this ungratefulness towards the husband, specifically to the wives. I gave you the fiqhi reason. The fiqhi reason is the one who's fulfilling the obligation, right, versus the one to whom the obligation is being done to. This was one aspect, meaning Allah to us, or the parents to us. So the one who is doing the obligation, you still have to thank him, even if he's doing his obligation. So, uh, so now I just want to read the idea of gratitude, and then we'll understand it from a more practical perspective. That if women, because if women have the sense of gratitude in their life, right, then it changes the whole cycle. If the husband is thankful, if the husband has gratitude, if the husband has shukr, if the husband is thankful, it doesn't change the circle, it just affects him. It just what? Affects him. But if the wife is gra grateful and has gratitude, it affects the whole family. You will see how I will explain this. So I'm going to read parts of this research, only the beginning parts, and then inshallah in the next dafs I will go more into the hadith itself, and I will also go more into the issue of gratitude. But this is, I just want it to be known, this is something not only the Prophet said, that women, uh, they do this kind of like ungratefulness, and that they'll at the end of the day say, you know, you did nothing for me, uh, you have done nothing good for me. This is something that is being studied, has been studied, research has been done on this. But that research isn't very popular because no one today wants to study about things that affect men. Everyone wants to talk about the things that affect the women. So I'm going to start about uh, talking about the issue of gratitude, its effects. Because when you have gratitude, when you have shukr, you are being thankful for what you have now. You're being thankful for what you have no. now. Not something in the future. Not something you'll have after a year. Not after, you know, your... your it's about the here and the now. Shukr is about acknowledging the good that you have with you at that moment that you are doing, showing gratitude. In fact, I'll also mention this. The issue of gratitude is so powerful that psychologists have only recently begun to study the effects of gratitude in, in human life. In fact, uh, the word sh shukr, which is all over Quran, is only being accepted as a human emotion recently in psychology. In, in the books that you've probably read, shukr was probably not even an emotion that you studied, right? It wasn't even there. It's only recently that even now, the textbooks, they don't have it. It's just the research. It's the research papers that these people write. They have these things. But you, you don't study shukr as a gratitude or as an emotion. Even though it's the most basic thing. You do something to someone and then he feels like, oh, I wish I could do something for him like he's done for me. It's such a basic thing. But it's all over Quran and it's not there. Even in modern psychology, they don't really teach this. And uh, so anyway... So let me just mention a few things about this and then we will go into more details. The essential grant, uh, so he is summing up in this paragraph all the works that have been done in gratitude. So he says, the essential, gra uh, the, the essential, the essen essential message of these volumes is that a life oriented around gratefulness is the cure for yearning and life's ills. Grateful, grateful responses to life can lead to peace of mind, happiness, physical health, and deeper and more satisfying personal relationships. So he says basically this is the end result of all the research that's been done. But I want to go into more specifics. He says, classical writers focused on the good life. Now he's talking about not only psychologists, he's talking about philosophers. Classical writers who focused on good life emphasized the cultivation and expression of gratitude for the health, vitality of both citizenry and society. Across culture, time spans, experiences, and expressions of gratitude have been treated as both basic and desirable aspects of human personality and social life. For example, gratitude is highly praised human disposition in Jewish, Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu thought. 
Cicero, the philosopher, held that gratitude is not only the greatest of virtues, but it is the parent to all others, and so on and so forth. So gratitude is a universal emotion that's been understood. Uh, I'm only going to read a few more things, if you just bear with me. It's going to make things easier to understand. Um, gratitude is aptly uh, conveyed by this author. He says, in this attitude, people recognize that they are connected to each other in a mysterious and a miraculous way. This is not fully determined, that is not fully determined by physical forces, but is part of a wider or transcendent context. Meaning, this idea of shukr actually itself proves the existence of Allah, but I'm not going to go into that right now. Then, then he says, now who knows uh, Abraham Maslow? Everybody heard of Abraham Maslow? The hierarchy of needs, right? Abraham Maslow. Okay, so Abraham Maslow is a psychologist who talks about hierarchy of needs. The highest of them is self-actualization, where you find yourself. Okay, the most basic of them is like things like food, water, right? Security. These are the basic things human beings need. The highest is where you find yourself. So he, Abraham Maslow, unlike many other psychologists, he studied what makes a good personality, what makes a strong personality. So when he looked at people that have good personalities, what did he find? Core characteristics of self-actualizing individuals studied by Maslow. Self-actualizers, according to Maslow, had the capacity to appreciate again and again, freshly and naively, the basic goods of life with awe, pleasure, wonder, etc., etc. This ability to freshly appreciate everyday experience enabled self-actualizers to derive a sense of pleasure, inspiration, strength from even mundane happenings. So it continues. I won't go any further, but I just wanted to, I'll go over parts of this a little bit later. So what is it that I'm basically saying? I'm saying that gratitude helps a person do what? To appreciate what he has here and now. And when you have this gratitude, what happens? How does it change the environment? So this is how it changes the environment. Let's say a wife, she thinks that her husband doesn't pay her attention. She thinks what? My husband's not paying attention. She is coming into the house and she sees him watching TV. What is her response? If she's ungrateful, then she won't bring herself to her potential to change anything. Being ungrateful means you've become bitter. Being ungrateful means that you can no longer use your influence to make any change. Being bitter means, or ungrateful means, you accept things, or you accept un things unwillingly as they are. Being opposite of being grateful is what? Ungrateful, right? And that means that if you don't like your situation, you're gonna just accept it, but you're not gonna do anything what? About it. But now if this wife, she walks into the house and the husband's watching TV and she thinks to herself, see, he's not going to give me any, he's not going to give me any attention, he's watching TV. So nothing will change because she entered the house from that, from that perspective. And that's what she'll get. But if a wife says, if she's more thankful to Allah, Right? And she's more grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And she goes into the house, the husband's watching TV. Now that TV is no longer an obstacle for her. Right? She believes that she, because she's thankful, she can be more optimistic. Because she's more optimistic, she'll actually maybe walk up to her husband and say, Let's, can we go for a walk together? Or she'll actually try to make steps to make some changes. Do you see what I'm trying to say? Optimism allows the human beings to actually see the opportunities you have in the here and the now. Instead of looking at the negatives of the past or the fears of the future, instead of looking at the negatives of the past or the fears of the, fe fears of the future, shukr allows you to look at the opportunities that are before you and you can av avail from those opportunities that are before you if you have the attitude of shukr. Otherwise you will not be able to avail from those Things. So now the Prophet is saying that for all the things the husband is doing, she never saw them as she never saw them as opportunities to connect. 
because she's so worried about what the past was like or what the future may be like. Because of the fear of the future and the sadness and negativity of the past, she's unable to appreciate what? The here and the, the, here and the now. She's not able to see what's coming to her as an opportunity to connect to her husband. And this is why it is so important that, again, when we talk about uh, the fiqhi aspects versus the, the aspects of ihsan, because the solutions of Islam are not in the fiqhi aspects. The solutions of Islam have to do with the ihsan aspect, the, the doing the greater good aspect. And so the Prophet ﷺ is saying that this will have, it's not just that, oh, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to punish, Allah created women and Allah doesn't love women and He's just going to throw them all into the hellfire. This is not the issue. The issue is if women adopt this attitude of ungratefulness, it affects the family so much. It affects the family so much that it could possibly be such a big crime that it will take a person to the hellfire. Because not having gratitude towards your parents, or to your husband, or anyone who's done good to you, is a very fundamental human flaw. It's a very basic human flaw. And it means your fitra, your fitra, your, in your actual human nature has died. Because in Islam, the measurement of how pure your fitra is, how pure your human, Nature is, the measurement of that is shukr. Right? So the measurement of how pure your fitra is, is what? Shukr. So if women, so it's not just that they're doing kufr of their husbands. Because when they're doing kufr of their, meaning when they are being ungrateful to their husbands, they are more so being ungrateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're being ungrateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because how many, and this is one thing brothers should do. And this is one of the problems that we have an awesome opportunity for in the masajids. We don't do it. And that is that one of the things sisters should do and husbands should do is that let the fortunate ones become friends with the unfortunate ones so that the wives can see how they, people that are less fortunate, how they live. How some of the African American community members, they live, but yet they're so grateful. And let them that are poor see how the rich live, yet they're still so sad. And so this, because this aspect, we have to create an environment of shukr in the, in, in, around us. And how do you do that? You let the fortunate meet the unfortunate. And the unfortunate meet the fortunate. And see who you can then see. People, they have, they have so much, but they're still, they're bitter still. There are people that have nothing, and yet they're so happy still. Let the wives, the wives need to see this too. The women need to see this. This is why the relationship between the different communities, especially different ethnic groups, is very, it's very, it's all very important in order to be able to really, to have an observation of, 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 of the reality of life itself. But anyway, so I was saying that because what? Like I'll just mention this. I know many of you probably already know this, but I'm just going to mention this quickly. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this topic of shukr in the Quran, most profoundly in Surah Luqman, Allah starts by saying, وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا لُقْمَانَ الْحِكْمَةَ أَنِشْكُ We gave Luqman what? Hikmah. So that he would be able to? Thank Allah. Now what does hikmah have to do with shukr? And what's the opposite of shukr? وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا لُقْمَانَ الْحِكْمَةَ أَنِشْكُرْ لِلَّهِ وَمَنْ يَشْكُرْ فَإِنَّمَا يَشْكُرُ لِنَفْسِ And whoever gives gratitude to Allah, he does it for his own self. Because if you can't see the good in you, good around you, that means that there's no... If you can't see it, it means you're yourself blind. You can't see the good around you. You can't see the ni'mas of Allah around you. This is one of the things, the most essential things that Allah calls for in the Qur'an all over and over again. وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا لُقْمَانَ الْحِكْمَةَ أَنِشْكُرْ لِلَّهِ وَمَنْ يَشْكُرْ فَإِنَّمَا يَشْكُرْ لِنَفْسِهِ وَمَنْ كَفَرَ The opposite of shukr is kufr. 
وَمَنْ كَفَرَ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَنِيٌ حَمِيدٌ Then Allah is self-sufficient, self-praiseworthy. Allah doesn't need your gratitudes and anything from you. It's if you do it, it means there's something good in you that you're able to thank Allah for something He's done to you. And what is the relationship between shukr and hikmah? This also needs to be clear. Wisdom is not hikmah. Wisdom is not hikmah. Hikmah is something that has to do with human fitrah. Wisdom is something that has to do with human fitrah. Wisdom comes from understanding human nature, human disposition. When you make a, an, a conclusion using information you have on the external, when it coincides with the fitrah inside, when it coincides with the what? The fitrah inside you, when the two information, knowledge, and good fitrah come together, it gives you hikmah. This is hikmah. For example, let me give you an example. <coughs> Not lying. Don't lie. Don't lie. It is the, this is hikmah. Don't lie. If you tell the truth, you're, you know, you will have, it's better for you. If you tell the truth, right? Yuslih lakum a'malakum. Waqul qawlan sadida, yuslih lakum a'malakum. So, if you don't lie, if you don't steal, if you don't do these wrong things, what does it relate to? It relates to knowledge on the outside, the effects of the outside, and the human fitrah, the human nature. Hikmah is under, understanding the highest truths that have to do with human nature. This is wisdom. Wisdom is understanding human nature. And I can't go into... <coughs> hikmah is from hukum. You know, hukum means something strong, something unbreakable. Anyway, this is a separate topic. So, but the point I'm trying to say only is what? Is that if one of the things, and this is one of the things that it's easy for sisters when they are in a moody position, when they're what? When their wave is going up and down, right? So some days they're happy and then some days they may not be as happy. So what happens? When they're not so happy, then they will say things, and this is also another hadith in which I will talk about the 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 how women communicate. Uh, there's another hadith just on this issue, which I will talk about, inshallah, maybe next time or the time after. But when women say things, so women have to learn not to say things when they're, they are in a certain mood. And I know women just don't like it when you say uh, that because of their uh, cycles or because of their natural biology, they will go through certain emotions. They don't like that being mentioned. Uh, but anyway, it's a fact, it's a reality. And uh, so when they are in these waves, they should recognize that and they should not bring themselves about to say statements, what? That are negative. Because when the wife puts down her husband, you've never done anything good for me, what happens as a result? What happens as a result? Because men show connection by doing what? Women show connection by talking, by communicating. Women show connection by? By communicating. Guys show connection by what? By, in simple words, by being the man. Right? He's the man. He's in charge. He's the leader. Right? He's the one who provides. Any time a female, and if you read Dr. Laura Leschlinger's works on this, any time a guy feels that my wife doesn't look up to me, or my wife doesn't appreciate me, or my wife doesn't respect me, what does it do to the guy? Meaning, what will it do to the family? It'll break apart the family. They'll be in the same marriage, but they will be what? Getting more distant from each other. Right? And that's not the solution. So what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say about causing division in marriage? So you have to be, because the Prophet said most people, and the general principle everyone agrees. Most people will go to the hellfire because of what's between their mouths, and what's between their legs. So here Allah, the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning something specific of that, which is that when women tend to say, you have done nothing for me. And this is such a common experience that if you ask the Arab brothers, they'll say it. If you ask the Arabs, if you ask the, the Desi, if you ask the white American, if you ask the African American, everyone knows that this is a cross-cultural experience that means that it's universal for women 
to express this type of attitude specifically using the words, you have never done, you've never loved me, you never did anything good for me. And this is a very common thing. And you know, when I sit in counseling many times for couples, husbands and wives, one of the most often complaints I hear from the husband is, you know, I work day and night. Right? She doesn't realize I'm working day and night. I drive a taxi, I'm going for 12 hours. And all she does is complain. All she does is say that you don't love me. And then the poor guy, he tries harder and harder and harder. But she's never, what? She's never appreciative. What will that do to that marriage? And then the wives, they're upset that my husband doesn't love me. But by that time, he really is, he doesn't know what to do. He's given up. And so, really women, when they, as I have seen this myself in counseling, when women push their men by saying, you've done nothing for me. And of course, every scenario is different. Every scenario is specific. I'm talking in general. This shouldn't be taken as a hard and fast rule. But I have seen that sisters can push their husbands by saying certain things to the point that the husband is still the husband, but he's given up. He doesn't feel like trying harder. Because he feels that no matter what I do, she's going to be unappreciative of whatever I do. But on the other hand, I have seen where couples are there and where the wife is very supportive of her husband. And you can find, you can find a, you can see the result, the encouragement of, let's say, a brother and a sister that are married together, but the wife is supportive, she believes in her husband, she wants better for her husband, she's pushing her husband. Let's say, I'll give you one example, the husband, you know, he um, just came out of prison, he still drinks alcohol, he's a Muslim, he's taken the shahada, he still, he wants to become a better Muslim. The wife has been Muslim all her life, but she married this brother who went to prison, and now they're together, and they have issues, and, but the wife is supportive. The wife believes in something about her husband that he can transcend all of this. And what happens? He will leave his alcohol, he will find a good job, he, because now he feels happy to prove his wife right. He feels pleasure in find, proving to his wife that yes, I was worth supporting. And I was, you know how they say behind every great man there's a great woman, right? So every sister who is married, especially in these times, should be very thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah has had her get married. And even if he's doing his obligations, doesn't mean that, oh, he's doing the, my, his obligations, I don't have any, you know, I mean, how else are you, if you're not going to be thankful over the most basic things, how are you going to be thankful over the less basic things? And the other thing that I was mentioning was, is that the, the community should be involved with other people who are, if they're fortunate, with the less unfortunate, if they're less fortunate, with the more fortunate, so that the wives in the community, and our, the women in our community, they understand that, they, that, so that they can be grateful. So that they, I know this because I know one brother and one sister, and the wife used to complain about the bills all the time. I told the brother, why don't you become brothers with some of these African American brothers who work so hard to provide for their family. And they're so happy. And so they became friends, these two couples I was talking about. And the, alhamdulillah, the wife understood, you know, that she's so lucky. Her, wife, her husband's in the IT field, he makes $70,000. She has so much to be grateful to. So much more to be grateful for. And, uh, you know, and that, uh, so the, uh, you know, because the male's weakness is the wife. And the wife's weakness is the children. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made this triangle. The women's biggest weakness is the children. And the male's biggest weakness is the, is the, uh, uh, the, uh, is, is the, the male's weakness is the wife, and the wife's weakness is the children. And so, if the wife doesn't, if his weakness brings, because what's your weakest can either affect you the most, or the, or affect you the worst, right? For the most better outcome, or for the worst outcome. So if your wife is supporting you, it will bring out the best outcome. If the Prophet didn't have Khadija, imagine in Mecca, and even the Prophet's wife is against him. I mean, that would have been so horrible. He was so lucky that he was able to go to his best friend, which was Khadija radiallahu anha, who believed in the Prophet before he believed in himself. 
right? She supported him, and she gave him the encouragement. Had she not had that encouragement, Allah knows what could, I mean, of course, what Allah will happen. But it's just understanding that Khadija played a major role in the Prophet ﷺ in the support that he had to reach the, the, the heights that he had. So in the same way, and you know, it's interesting, we say Abu Bakr as siddiq right? And, Khadid, uh, and who do we use the word Siddiq of? Khadija radiallahu anhu. Right? So anyway, uh, the point here is that uh, the, this hadith of the Prophet should not be taken in such a negative way. I do want to show one more thing from this uh, research book here, uh, very quickly. And that is, in order to have gratitude, two elements are required. To have gratitude, what? Two elements are required. The first is interpersonal context, meaning it's a relationship, of some, in, some interaction between two people. For gratitude is an interpersonal emotion which precludes it from being directed towards oneself. Second, implicit in the experience of gratitude is the recipient's theory of mind from which he or she infers another's well-meaning intention. So, shukr is to, under, is to have, uh, when you feel shukr for someone, you understood someone had good intentions towards you. Then you feel shukr. So one aspect is you, you are thankful for, and content with what you have in the here and the now, number one. Number two, because of that, you can actually see the positive opportunities before you, rather than being kufr. Kufr means to cover, right? Kufr means, literally kufr means to cover. When you have kufr, you will be in a state of kufr. Meaning, when you have, when you do kufr, when you're ungrateful, the ni'mas, they're like, you don't see the ni'mas. You have the ni'mas, but you can't see the ni'mas. They're covered from you. And you can't enjoy the ni'mas if you're in a state of kufr. You can't enjoy the goodness that's around you if you're in a state of kufr. And so, and the second thing is that you can feel the good intentions of the person who is doing something good to you. Right? And so, for women who are connectors, women by nature are connectors, if they feel gratitude, they will feel that good, in, they will feel that good intention. If they're aware of this, it'll, it'll have a greater impact upon them. So this is what I wanted to talk about today. How much time do I have? Five minutes? Okay, so I'll end here. So I just wanted to say that this hadith shouldn't be looked at as such a negative hadith where some of the women and Orientalists and non-Muslims have taken this hadith to, to use it as kind of like a way of talking against uh, how chauvinistic Islam is or how anti-women Islam is. This is not the case because the women are being talked about here, not in general, but in the context of a family with a husband and a wife. And the Prophet ﷺ, being the Prophet of Allah, understands how important it is that the wife be grateful for the good that's around her, including the good that her husband is doing to her. And if you believe in God, it, it ultimately reflects on what? Because if the if there is no difference, if a wife, if a, if it's son, if a son is ungrateful to his parents, it's like he's doing, he's un, being ungrateful to Allah. Allah. And when the when she becomes a wife, she is now no longer under the supervision of her parents per se. She's now under the supervision of her husband. husband. Yeah. And if she's doing, she's being ungrateful to her husband, then what happens? Then it means that she's actually being ungrateful to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and that means what the the opportunities that are before her. Because in, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? If you do shukr, we will what? Increase for you. This is the universe, secret of the universe. Secret of the universe. Successful people, they have gratitude. Because they have gratitude, they get more. It's just, it's just the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you're going to be ungrateful, you, you will not, the, the, the more ungrateful you are, the less blessings you see. It means you're blind. And the more grateful you are, the more... Blessings you see means you can see. So, you know, it is very important that it is in this context that the Prophet ﷺ is saying that the majority of the women will be in hell, meaning just as there will be majority in Jannah, but women will go to hell very prevalently for this simple reason of not controlling 
their emotions and not controlling what they say to their husbands and the effect it had on their husbands. Because the one thing Islam cares about that the Western civilization doesn't seem to care about is the practical aspects of what makes a good family. I'm talking about not theoretical, the practical things that cause a family to not just be a family that's just together, but to be a family that's in harmony, a family that's, that's really in touch with one another. That can only happen if, because when the children see mother is grateful to the father, then the children also see that, they're affected by that. If the mother is always complaining to the father, the children will always be complaining to him. And then they will marry on and they will have their effects. So it is very important that uh, we keep these things in mind. I mean, uh, when you look at it completely uh, in a cold, uh, when I say cold, I mean just from a logical perspective, cold empirical evidence, you don't see this hadith as being anything negative against women. But it's just acknowledging that they have a weakness, they should recognize this weakness, they should work on this weakness. And this weakness, if it's, if it's overcome, then what? Then, then the whole family can be in harmony. And in the same way, there are other hadiths that talk about men, for example. So anyway, this is something we will be discussing in the future. Can we shut that off?